Thank you very much, David. Um, I lean in on the mic because I think it might be difficult enough for some people at the back to hear. Um, maybe we're the skeptical, the skeptic society. You know, I think it, dep it all depends on what you're skeptical about. Um, I want to talk about uh, first about uh, really the situation we're in. I mean, we can go at this particular question from many directions, but I want to start by reading you a quotation from an interview that was conducted last night with the Minister for Communications in Liberty Hall in response to the judgment of the Supreme Court in relation to the children's referendum and the illegal use of government funds uh, to promote one side of that referendum. And this is what the Minister said. And he said, he said, first of all, that he, he protested that the uh, position of the government had been uh, uh, based on passionate conviction, which was an interesting construction. You know, I, I kind of imagine these guys sitting around their cabinet table being passionate and convinced about uh, things. Uh, but it doesn't quite come for me. Um, uh, conviction, um, perhaps a criminal conviction uh, <laughs> uh, uh, here or there wouldn't go amiss. Um, but he went on, the minister went on. He said, it's an unusual situation. I mean, these, these guys use words very carefully. It's an unusual situation that you elect a government and the government seems to be impeded from advocating its convictions in a, manner, in a matter like a referendum. Now, it's an unusual situation. That's an unusual phrase. It seems to be more or less saying, look, those guys in the Supreme Court, you know. But what's interesting about that is that it's complete nonsense because... It, the government is not impeded in any way, shape or form from advocating its convictions if it has any or had any. What it was impeded from was spending our money uh, telling one side of an, putting one side of an argument. Uh, so there are two conclusions to be drawn, two possible conclusions to be drawn, I think, from this statement of the minister. One is that he's stupid. Uh, and the second one, and there are no th there's no third, the other one is that he thinks we're stupid. Um, and I think the latter. I think this is an interesting uh, point that we need to reflect on. Because C.S. Lewis, uh, uh, writing him on, this, on, on the subject of the abolition of man, he called it, starting with the abolition of God, he came to the conclusion that the abolition of uh, God was actually really the abolition of man. Uh, but he talked about two kinds of people in a society without God. There is the conditioners and the conditioned. And at a certain point, he says, the, conditioned, the conditioners who create the new order develop a contempt for the conditioned. And I think this, this, is this statement of the minister, which is not unusual and which is not unique, is reflective of that uh, contempt. That the people who now condition us, who put before us the various items of their agenda, which remains to, this, to an extent opaque, uh, become contemptuous and impatient with our reluctance or reticence or our requests for clarification or perhaps argument and, uh, and so on. And they become utterly impatient, not just with the people, but with the Supreme Court, who you know, are not exactly people, uh, I, I, I don't believe, uh, not in my experience. But, um, so that's a, I think that's an interesting moment. Another way you could put that would be to say that that statement of the ministers was really a message from the bunker. And I'll explain what I mean. The bunker is, a, I've been going around the country for the last couple of years talking about these questions uh, to various kinds of groups in halls and churches and all kinds of places, schools and so on. And I found myself all the time talking back, coming back to this concept of the bunker, which the Pope, uh, Pope Benedict articulated in the Bundestag in September of last year in Berlin, and he said that man has created a bunker for himself to live in uh, without windows. Uh, a bunker made up of a, a, a form of thought and a, a form of perception, uh, constructed of man's desire for omnipotence and omniscience in his own environment, in his own uh, space, um, which shut out the mystery. And in this bunker there is a form of thought which becomes highly persuasive. The Pope referred to it as you know, in, in line with positivism, the, the desire that everything that is believed must be proved, everything must be demonstrated, everything must be measurable, weighable, it must be, uh, everything is like, it becomes increasingly like a court of law, where the only things which are admissible are those which are absolutely known in terms which can be set forth almost mathematically. And that's essentially what we are constructing, a bunker in which Man becomes 
his own, the master of everything, including himself, the master of his environment, the master of all facts, all knowledge. Uh, so that because in the space that he has constructed, this rectangular space that he has built around himself, he knows everything. Everything is coherent. Everything makes sense. There is nothing mysterious, nothing unknowable. And this gives man a sense of omnipotence. And out of that then he constructs a world which is his own, man, the man-made world, um, which by definition excludes the God-made world and excludes God from the man-made world. And that's essentially what we are doing. I think this is the most vital insight that we need to have about our life now. Um, because when we talk about the, lo the loss of God in our society, or the obliteration, the annihilation of God in our society, we do need to reflect on what that might mean, because it is not the ab abolition of God. It is the abolition of God for man, or the removal of God from man's sight, or from man's knowing. Um, and it's like a little bit like that environmental argument, which I often feel is, you know, when people, environmentalists talk about the earth, they're always, they're, they're talking about us, they're talking about themselves. They're talking about the survival of this species as opposed to the survival. The earth will survive when we're all obliterated. But in the same way, when we talk about abolishing God, it is ourselves we will abolish because God will go on. So the question is then, you know, when I go around the country, I find myself confronted by audiences of people from towns, countryside, cities in some cases, and they, I find them really in a very confused state uh, at this moment because they have no words for how they feel. They have no words for where, what their situation is. They have no words for where their children are going to grow up, or how they might deal with that, how they might speak to their children about this place. Um, they believe, because they have been told, that something fundamental has changed in our culture. That uh, the belief, the faith that they grew up with, the beliefs which they took for granted, have somehow been superseded by something called reality and time. The time, a few years, 10, 15, maybe 25 years at the most, has obliterated everything that man believed before that and rendered it all nonsensical. And this is now becoming the kind of the dominant uh, ideology of our culture, of our country. It's implicit in everything that is said publicly in, from the main organs of conversation and everything that is not said also. It is present also in the, the omissions and the avoidances and so on that occur in those conversations. So um, what do you say to such people? Is it true? When I, was in school, when I went to school, the first uh, question in the catechism that we learned for First Communion, the very first question was, who made the world? And the answer was, God made the world. And at that time, for me, this was a totally superfluous question and a completely unnecessary answer. Because it seemed to me that, that the very fact of asking the question brought into the equation a kind of doubt that seemed uh, not to belong there. Because it seemed to me as a child that only the, the hypothesis that I had been offered that the world had been, that I had been created by a divine uh, uh, being made any sense to me. And nothing that I've heard since has made any sense, uh, more sense to me. And yet, now, we do, this question is not alone necessary to be asked. We need to ask it every day, in a sense. But in a sense, we need to defend what we answer from almost the ether, from the, the very air around us. It is as if it's as if this, uh, the very uh, uh, nature of man has changed. The very nature of our minds has changed. And the people who come before me, therefore, they, they have this strange uh, dualism. That on the one hand, they believe that they hang, they believe fervently in the things they were told. They believe in a way that is, becomes, in a sense, more intense the more threatened these beliefs become, the more they be scoffed at they become, the more dismissed they become. And yet at the same time, they have this sense which sort of grows up from within them that the world somehow has changed and that reality has rendered these beliefs somewhat implausible, which causes them to hang on to them even more. So there's this strange tussle in them. 
and that they, they seem to be almost afraid to, to look squarely at the questions uh, and to ask the questions and to say, is it true? Did God make the world or did he not make the world? I say to them, you know, there's only these two options. I can't think of a third. He either made the world or he didn't. We must ask this question again and say, what do we believe? Because it seems to me that the world that we have uh, evolved uh, in the culture we have evolved every day that confronts us, and I'm talking about in culture, I mean, by culture, I mean everything we encounter in the course of the day, every conversation in the streets, in the pub, on the radio, on the television, all of these things, all the images that, that confront us. These, this culture really, it seems to actually have arrived at a different conclusion to the one that was in the Catechism without actually explicitly very often saying that this is what it has arrived at. It seems to have, and for many of us then, for many people I find that there's almost as if a new pocket has opened up in the consciousness. That there is a new pocket for in which religious ideas uh, are filed. That they are somewhere between fact and fiction. That they are not untrue, but they're not quite true either. Not true in the way that the budget is going to be true. Uh, not true in the way that Christmas is true, that Christmas will come on the 25th of December. But the story of the first Christmas is not quite true in that sense. It's true, but not quite like that. And I think that, that we have therefore allowed this third thought bubble to uh, grow over our heads, like in the comics, in which we have placed Christ and God and the holy and the, the sacred. And so we live our lives in other thought bubbles and we speak different languages and we hear different languages. But somehow this, this other thought bubble floats freely away from these. It never connects. But then you come back to the question, who made the world? God made the world. Is this true or is it not true? If it's true, then there can be no separate thought bubble. There is only one thought bubble. Everything is part of the same uh, consciousness. And this is what the, I think the Pope is talking about. That the bunker has created this third thought bubble, somewhere between history and fiction, in which the sacred is held, is spoken of, is thought of. This is, I think, uh, the first thing that we need to make. In many ways, the biggest problem, I think, in our culture is to make things visible. Because, uh, as I, is implicit in what I've been saying, the conversation doesn't belong to the holy. It doesn't belong to the religious. It doesn't belong to the faithful. We only have a certain limited access to it. We cannot use it to have the conversations that we want to, to have. Um, so, I think that when I speak to these people, they, they have this sense that there is almost an inexorable march of something like time, progress, modernity. And that somehow it is rendering, rendering their beliefs somewhat old-fashioned, if not uh, implausible, if not tithering on the obsolete. And yet they cling to them because they, they love the faith they grew up with. They love Christ, the Christ they know. They love many, the many things about the tradition and the, the inheritance that they have received. They love what it gives to their society, to their families. They love the stability that comes from the, the order it provides. So there is something that has happened to us, to our democracy, which is more, much worse than anything to do with referendums. That the capacity that we have to actually talk about ourselves has been stolen from us. When I say ourselves, I mean ourselves beyond our bunker uh, definitions. Our bunker definitions include worker, taxpayer, commuter, um, uh, student, uh, and so on. But our definitions of human beings, which are infinite, absolute, are not accounted for in this uh, thinking, in this positivism that, that pervades the bunker. So more and more we can only talk about certain reduced dimensions of ourselves in this space. Now if you turn on your radio in the morning at 7 o'clock and just try it one day if you have the stomach. <laughs> and listen to the radio right through until maybe seven in the evening and then turn on your television set and watch the news program on RT and the current affairs programs and perhaps again if your heart is still strong turn over to TV3 and watch Vincent Brown. <laughs> 
in that time, in none of those time, in none of those programs for those um, whatever it is, uh, 17 hours, will you hear anything that affirms you beyond the definitions of you as a taxpayer, a commuter, a worker, a citizen? You will not hear anything that affirms your humanity at its deepest level, at its infinite level, at the level of a point of origin that is mysterious to you, that goes from there on to a destination that could be beyond infinity if such a thing exists. Nothing will be admitted of such a definition of man. Nothing will be acknowledged. There will be a kind of a, not alone will there not be an acknowledgement, there will be a sucking out of that sense of yourself from every fiber of your being by exposing yourself to this uh, communication. You will actually feel a sense of something being missing. I, my mother died in, in September, and one of the great concerns I had about that moment coming uh, towards us. She was 92, and it was somewhat inevitable, but she had been very we well up to relatively late, and then she got a turn. And, and uh, you know, I, I had always this sense that I should talk to her about these things, but, uh, you know, in a way, in certain dimensions of our relationship, we never really got beyond the, the, the parent-child relationship. So she was the one who cared, she was the one who advised, she was the one who listened. The idea of turning the tables seemed to me to be a terrible uh, uh, presumption on my part. And I, I never, to my sorrow, never got the courage to find, to, to find a way of saying to her, you know, what do you feel? Because I used to worry about the fact that she would be listening to the radio and wondering about what kind of an assault this was conducting on her sense of, of what reality was. Because it wasn't, you don't need uh, full frontal attacks on faith for this uh, process to actually be deeply insidious and, and, and lethal. Um, you can actually have it in what I call an anti-impact moment, which happens all the time on radio and television, where this moment where something is inevitable that should be said, something cries out to be said and is not said, or something is avoided, is ducked. You know, like the guy who, there a couple of years ago on the radio, I heard him talking about, this was during the snow, and he was a, a meteorologist, and, and he was asked by somebody about the forecast, and he said, uh, well, I think there'll be a, a, a thaw next week, thank uh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, so that's what I call an anti-impact moment. It's what the great rock and roll writer, Lester Bangs, was talking about Van Morrison, the way Van Morrison would just stop. He talked about the hollow of a murdered uh, explosion. The hollow of a murdered explosion. It's a beautiful phrase, which I think which really captures this idea. That something that should have happened doesn't happen. Something that you think is obvious from the culture you've grown up in doesn't happen. Um, I'll give you a very clear graphic example, which I wrote about in my book, Beyond Consolation. It was an interview with, with Seamus Heaney on the occasion of his fifth, of 70th birthday and on the Marion Finucane show. And it's strange, it occurred exactly one year after the famous interview with uh, Nulo Fallon about her impending uh, death from cancer. So, you know, there was a context to this, a backdrop, as it were, exactly a year later. And Marion Finucane started by asking Seamus Heaney about his illness, which he had two years before, and he talked about that and a little. And then she said to him, in that context, I want to ask you about your beliefs. And he kind of giggled a bit and, and said, well, I was going to ask you the same question. And she said, no, no, seriously. And so he began this kind of really stream of consciousness, I would say. Uh, where he started to say things, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm not being unfair to, to him in this. He, he, it, it went something like this. Uh, well, of course, um, you know, there are, from here and there, uh, certain pockets of orthodoxy, as it were, but, you know, these days, Marion, um, you know, we middle-class people don't, you know, um, really uh, uh, any more think in that way about uh, these things and uh, of course perhaps you know in the magisterium and the Vatican and 
so forth, orthodoxy, yes, of course, but middle class people marrying, you know. And then, <laughs> then he kind of stopped and, and took a breath and then he said one word, and the word was extinction. And Marion Finucane said to him, what, you don't believe in extinction? And he said, no, I do. That's what happens. Now, I'm not telling this story to get at Seamus Heaney at all, because Seamus Heaney's poems, Seamus Heaney is the inheritor of the mantle of the greatest Catholic poet that ever walked the face of the planet, Patrick Kavanagh. Wouldn't exist, wouldn't have written perhaps a word had it Patrick Kavanagh preceded him. And his poems are full of the kind of imagery which he inherited from Kavanagh. So, you know, what, Pat, what Seamus Heaney believes or doesn't believe isn't really the point I'm making, although it is an interesting question. But my point is that nothing happened. This was one of those anti-impact moments where there was no, like here it was a sensational moment. The inheritor of Patrick Kavanagh's mantle, who had won with his poem, poetry the Nobel Prize for Literature, saying, in effect, that the basis of his po own poetry is bullshit that there's no basis for it. It seemed to me that at least there might be a question about, well, how do you still write the poems? Out of what do you now write the poems if you don't believe in this? But there was no follow-up at all. It was like, and this is what I mean, that you know, it's almost as if you know, the, 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 the hollow of a murdered explosion. This moment, like, it's like that moment, you know, when you're on the train and it stops at a station and there's another train alongside it. And you're there for a couple of moments. People get off and on. And you're kind of idly watching the carriage in the next train as people get on and off that. And the next thing you're aware of, it's very slow, lowly at first, very, very uh, motion. And you watch, and you have this sense of moving. And then the trains, go, they kind of pass each other. And then all of a sudden, there's this silent impact when you realize the other train is clear as yours, and you haven't been moving at all. And it's that kind of shock that you feel. And I think that, it, that sort of metaphysically, when, you, when these hot moments happen in our hearing culturally, this is what happens, that there is an impact which is not felt. But it's almost as if that you think, ah, oh, for, for, I must have fallen asleep for five years because all of these things have been agreed by everybody else. They've talked it to death and they've talked it all out and worked out, they've arrived at the answer and they've decided this, God doesn't exist or any of that stuff. And I, I must have been asleep. I must have taken something and, and dozed off and missed half a decade, at least. Because then they go on. And you see, then the next question immediately was, to Seamus Heaney was, and this was in 19, 2009, six months into the, what we, whatever we call the present uh, uh, meltdown, or, I don't know. Uh, it was six months after the, the news, the bad news, economically. And so the next question straight away was, what, do you t and what did you think of the Celtic tiger? As if, you know, the idea of um, extinction was like, you know, I like, well, I don't take sugar in my tea. <laughs> I, all right, okay. Um, <laughs> neither do I. Uh, okay, I, just, I shouldn't even say neither do I. Like, so what did you think of the Celtic time? Then it got really interesting, because then at this point, Seamus Heaney went into another stream of consciousness where he said, oh, well, now, um, funny enough, I've been thinking, you know, that maybe what's happening now, that's the meltdown, maybe what's happening now isn't such a bad thing, because, you know, for a while there, I was afraid we were going to lose our Christian consciousness. <laughs> <coughs> uh, and again, you think, oh, wow. So you think, hang on, hang on. Uh, you know, you, it's one of those moments when you want to be there and maybe say to Marion, maybe you, do you need a cup of tea or something? <laughs> uh, you just said, didn't you? Or did I mishear you? And now you're saying, so you think that the civilization we, we have built has been built on a lie. And you think that we should perpetuate that lie for a little longer at least. Are there other instances where you think lies are a good thing? Are there other lies that you would advocate that we should build on? Well, can you explain yourself? But there were no more questions. That was it. So this is, you know, and I, at those moments, listening to those things, I would think of my mother at home and wonder, what in the name of God is she thinking of? What's she making of all this? Or my daughter, who is, 
now 16, if she had the misfortune to turn on the radio at such a moment, which fortunately she doesn't as a rule, uh, what would she make of this? What are we expected to make of this? And who has decided that this is the way that such matters should be handled, dealt with? That when somebody comes on and says something momentous, something that by our culture, according to, the, to the, the, the beliefs of our culture going back for 1,500 years, that it's like as if it's not worth talking about, as if no, that nothing has been said at all, or nothing that isn't obvious, axiomatic. So this is, you know, the bunker, how is the bunker concentrated? This is how the bunker is constructed. The bunker is constructed of words and thoughts around our ears. And we become part of the bunker and the building of the bunker and the redecoration of the bunker and the reconstruction of the bunker and the making of a better bunker for ourselves to live in. Because unconsciously we all take part in this kind of dualism where we agree that certain things are not holy. Certain things belong to the unholy world or the world that is not holy. And we agree to have conversations about economics and uh, all kinds of things. Sociology, in which God is not necessary, or admissible, or permitted. <coughs> but we go back to the Catechism, who made the world? If God made the world, then it includes this and this. So how can we have a discussion about economics that isn't about God? Well, we do. And not alone do we do, but we assume that that's the natural order of things. So we're all complicit in the building of this bunker. The culture that we, you know, there is no, in a sense, there is a Politburo, uh, complicated, but we are, in a sense, part of the Politburo as well. I think that was what, what Christ was really getting at when he said to Peter, you know, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. Because I feel myself doing this. Because in all kinds of contexts, you know, you kind of pull back now from stating something in the words that will have a certain meaning, a very a deadening meaning, a meaning that will fall on the floor like a stone and will bring an end to conversations and cause people to stare at their shoes and <laughs> look at their watches. <laughs> and we assume that that's a natural state of affairs. We assume that, that something has happened to reality, to logic, to reason that has rendered this inevitable. You know, we, we, will, we have our faith, we, we adhere to it in certain private moments, in certain places that are permitted, but not in reality, not in the mainstream of reality. Is this, which is right, which is it? I mean, is, is, is this a good way to live? I mean, is, is this vindicated by some march of time and reality? Does reason dictate that this is how we behave? That there is no other way of behaving? That, that our faith becomes a kind of a nostalgic hangover, a kind of a residual thing that we, we cling to out of a loyalty or a desire for consolation or a fear of the unknown or a, re a ritual to grease everyday life? to, as some newspaper headline in the Irish Times, Hatch, Match and Dispatch the other day. Is that what it is? I think we have to, it's time. It's time we face these questions. It's time we ask them very clearly of ourselves. I think there's a tendency we have in the modern world, and I don't in any sense decry it, but I think we need to look beyond it. It is necessary. I mean, for Catholicism in Ireland, when it speaks now, it speaks defensively about certain narrow moralistic issues. It seeks to speak in relation to very, to express itself in relation to certain topics, whether it be abortion or gay marriage or whatever. And it seems to me that this actually simply accelerates the process that I'm talking about. I'm not saying it is wrong to do this. But I'm saying that it does accelerate the process because it creates this sense of opposition that there is the past, this backward, reactionary, uh, traditionalist way of thinking against the modern, forward-looking, rational, progressive way of thinking. 
Again, like the question, did God make the world? Is the answer to this yes or no? Is the world really like this? Is it not? If it's not, can we find words to say why it's not? Now, this is the trap that people are in, I find. And, and, and they don't think there's a way out of it except to ignore it, to avoid it, to avoid the question. I believe there is a way of not avoiding it. I believe there is a way of confronting it. But we need to actually, first of all, make the bunker visible. Make, possible, make it possible for ourselves to diagnose precisely where we are in our culture. And then to find a way of speaking new sentences about the fundamental things. Um, for example, you know, when we talk about traditional values or family values, I mean, there's a tendency in our culture, I mean, immediately this becomes, if you're on the other side, I promise you, if you're in the Irish Times uh, editorial meeting and the phrase family values is used, it's used in a pejorative way. It's used as a kind of a sneer. So it immediately summons up a whole world which is on the point of being obsolete, which no longer understands the world, which no longer accepts the way the world has changed because of progress and modernity and so on. Um, and in a certain sense, you know, I think that the, not alone is, of course it's unfortunate, but in a certain sense, it's a wake up call. Because it's no longer you know, possible for us to simply talk about traditional values or family values as kind of off the peg concepts which seem to be axiomatic and which seem to speak for themselves. We need to take them right back to the very basis in reality. What is family values? It is the family values are those values which derive from the blood link, the biological link between parents and children. This fundamentally is, it's, so therefore it is a given. It, these things are given to us by whatever we want to call God nature, whatever word we seek to put on this, they are given to us. And we need to therefore, rather than to speak in a way that is ideological about these things, which sort of assumes that their logic is axiomatic and obvious, um, because it isn't anymore in our culture, or at least there's a disingenuous element in our culture which pretends that it isn't, or which seeks to change that. C.S. Lewis talks about this whole thing, that one of the first things that happens when you obliterate God, when you remove God from you, is that you have this, first of all, this conditioners and the conditioned. And the conditioners create a new conscience. Now, the strange thing about this conscience is that it's, it's based on their ideas of freedom, it's based on their ideas of desires, it's based on their ideas of rights and so on. But it calls in all of the qualities and virtues and values which are bequeathed us by tradition. Uh, and this is what the Pope is saying about the bunker, that the bunker uses the material given by God. That we build the bunker with God's, with God's things, God's material, and then we deny the source of these materials. But when you do that in the area of values, something added happens, something different happens, which is that because you no longer have bedrock, you no longer have any basis on which things can be agreed or understood. So we, we really start to make it up as we go along. And uh, in the traditional way of seeing things, there was bedrock. There was the idea, the idea that man had been created by God and each man had been given an individual dignity uh, and autonomy. So each person was sacred, holy. And out of this came the whole understanding that we have had until relatively recent, recently in our culture, which is now what is precisely, precisely what is under attack. It is precisely this idea, the idea that, it is, that there is a given reality, that there is an absolute reality, that there is a, a dignity for each human being on the basis that they are created. The idea of rights, seeks to appropriate these concepts and translate them into a new paradigm in which there is no, which there is no bedrock. And yet it depends on, duty, on concepts like duty. What is there to be dutiful about if there is no God? What is there to be moral about? This constantly comes up, this argument about, you know, oh, 
I'm an atheist, are you saying I'm not a, mor a moral person? I always say, well, I'll tell you what, let's adjourn for 2,000 years and come back and see how, we've, how your model goes. Because you are sucking in the air of Christian civilization all your life. And you depend for your security and your knowledge and your hope on the very air that you dismiss, the very oxygen that you seek to deny. So, okay, see you in 2,000 years. We need to start paying attention beyond the ideological. I think there's a danger that what has happened to our faith in Ireland now is that it's, the strong parts of it have become the ideological ones, where we become defensive when we start to find, defend certain, define clear things. And of course, when, the, when death becomes confused with freedom, obviously it's time to act. But we need to think back to where it is, what is the basis of this? It's a much deeper thing. It has a, it has a root in our culture, if root is the right word. It is, a, it is really a tentacle deep in our culture, a culture that is being constantly reconstructed. Really not on the basis of any uh, solid foundation but on the basis of two things really, a reaction against what was there for its own sake and a pursuit of freedom defined by instinct, which translates into rights, individual rights and so on. So this is remaking the world, but it's remaking the world in a chaotic and senseless way. And because we have not developed the language sufficiently to actually speak of the true basis of these principles, values, it is very easy to dismiss them as the mere ideological sort of uh, fetishes of a beleaguered and pendingly obsolescent people. When I speak around the country, I try to kind of, I suppose, by a series of tricks, try to show people that actually this bubble, this punk bunker, first of all, make it visible to them, and secondly, show them that the kind of way that we have been taught to think in this bunker is actually not absolute. It is not, a, it is not the case that our faith has been rendered obsolete. It is not the case that it has been superseded by anything, by time, by fact, by reality. You know, for example, I mean, we take something like evolution, which is thrown to us as the trump card that is supposed to uh, uh, nullify, to, to negate the belief in God from one perspective. The strange thing is that nobody that I know of has sought to expand the idea of evolution outside of this planet. And yet the most rudimentary knowledge we have tells us that this planet is a tiny, 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 tiny speck. One of the things I do to people, you know, I talk to them about and make a comparison between the mathematics of an opinion poll, which, we, which is the line, uh, typical logic of the bunker, and the mathematics of human existence, my existence. And it goes something like this. If you can think of opinion polls, an opinion poll is supposed to tell us what we think, what we believe. Uh, and all of us pretty much in this room maybe there's maybe one or two I'm looking around would probably dissent but most people would kind of kind of nonchalantly and without much a second thought assume that an opinion poll does exactly what it says in the 10 that therefore that you know there's what about maybe 200 people that by talking to 200 people in a different room and somewhere else in this city you can decide what we all believe decide what we all think how could this be possible is it true well, it is true in a way. I mean, it is true. Experience tells us it's true. The, the consistency of the outcomes tells us it's true. But what is the nature of that truth, first of all? Is it something that is absolute about human nature? It is actually intrinsic to the, to the, to the nature of man that, that we are all alike in this way, that we all think alike? Or is it simply a symptom of the modern society that we belong to in which from 7 in the morning until midnight you hear the same things given to you as options, a menu of beliefs that you might have or might not have, and which, when you're asked, 
in certain proportions you give certain answers to, which happen to coincide across the whole spectrum of society, room to room, 200 people here, 200 people there. So there is this an absolute understanding of humanity, first of all. I believe it's not. I believe that, they, first of all, they tell us what to think, and then they ask us, what do we think? <laughs> so, but if you consider the mathematics of an opinion poll, you know, plus or minus, this thing of margin and error, two, plus or minus 3%, three, three percent, um, which is, you know, quite, a, you would think, quite a crude measurement in a way, but it tends to be extraordinarily and frighteningly accurate, by and large. I don't think we've had a rogue poll in Ireland really seriously now for a long, long time. So, you know, plus or minus 3%, 3 out of 100, we can more or less tell everything, measure everything in our society. So this is the positivistic, this is a, a classic example of the positivistic logic which defines everything we believe and think and know. Now compare this with the mathematics of human existence. I'm one of 7 billion human beings on this planet at the moment. And this planet is a tiny speck which spins around a tiny star, one of the tiniest stars in the Milky Way, one of billions of stars, in a galaxy that is itself one of billions of galaxies, in a universe that is one perhaps of trillions, on which parts there may be no evolution in some parts of this universe, who knows? <laughs> and, and I'm here now. Not 167 years ago, not 1227 years' time. Right now, I have a consciousness that is looking out onto this reality now. Understanding, apprehending, asking questions, trying to understand. It's objective consciousness. Right now. Now, either this is the most extraordinary impossibility. I mean, the odds against this are, I think, within the positivistic logic of the opinion poll, I think impossible beyond impossible. Who could possibly plan it? Who could possibly uh, make it happen? Who could imagine that, you know? It, it, but secondly, why does it not fill me with astonishment every waking second of my existence? That these odds def confirm, that define my existence. Something has happened here. That the wonder of my own existence has been stolen from me by a culture which tries to tell me that plus or minus 3% is a good way of measuring reality. So the, what has actually been taken is the wonder of our own existences in an extraordinarily wondrous uh, universe. And in this bunker we have been given back a version of ourselves which is box-shaped, which is tiny, reduced, taxpayer, commuter, civil servant, journalist, not human. So this is really, you know, when you abolish God and create the bunker in order to protect yourself from the consequences of you wanting to be God but not being God, because that's the most terrifying thing I think you can possibly think of, that you have decided you are God but you don't have his power. So what do you do? You build a bunker and then you become God of the bunker. So the most important things, I think, for our culture, really, the Pope, I think, is an extraordinary man. He gets a terrible bad press, not just from the press. Often, I think, often within church circles, I get a certain cynicism about him. I, I think he is the greatest Pope in my lifetime because he understands precisely the nature of the moment we're at and talks about it all of the time if, when he's allowed to speak to, as I say, the megaphone of his enemies who try to corrupt and change and warp everything he says, to pervert the message he tries to, to communicate. But he talks to us about the nature of man now. And what we glean from listening to him is that the crisis we're in is somewhat different to the one we thought we were in. You know, in Ireland we tend to define the crisis as something to do with perhaps the decline, and we talk about the decline of the church as if the decline of the institution were, were, the, main, were the main factor. And in fact, it's a, a symptom. Or we talk about the number of people attending religious services, mass and so on, uh, and the sacraments. And we, you know, whenever you, of course, obligingly, the media keep a close eye on such matters for us. 
um, even though they don't permit us to talk about these matters that I speak of. But what is the crisis? Is it the collapse of moral values arising from the silencing of the voice of the church? That's a part of it. But the real crisis is the human crisis. The crisis which, in which we all collude. We all are part of the crisis because in each in our own little ways, every day, including myself, I'm not pointing fingers, including myself, because we must live in the bunker. We need the bunker. We depend on the bunker. It's where we feel safe. It's where we understand totally. It's where we can function as human beings in the modern world. But because we have become so dependent on it and because it is so warm and so comforting in ways and does so much of our thinking for us, we've allowed the bunker to define everything, including ourselves. I think a lot of this has to do with cities as well. I think the bunker starts, the building begins in the city. And it's not so much the old idea of rural versus urban, which I've, I'm never, contrary to my reputation, I have never been a great believer in that kind of, uh, I know David. Yeah. <laughs> When I was a child, I mean, I grew up on a, in Castlery in County Roscommon, which is in Dublin terms a small town. But for me, it was a street. And for me, no matter where I'd gone in the world, to cities, a street is always pretty much the same. Existentially, it's the same shape, same thing. It's this place where tra traffic people move up and down. And the street tells you what to do, where to go, how to behave. There are lines and lights and corners and signs and all kinds of indicators to more or less dictate to you what reality is and how you should behave in it. I was lucky in that I lived in this, when I went out my back door, I walked into a wilderness because all the gardens at the back had run into one long since and there was a field at the bottom and a, a river and an island on the river and everything was overgrown so you could be lost there for days and nobody would find you. And that's to me is for me, it was metaphysically, that was for me a wilderness. And in the wilderness, you cannot but be aware of the mystery. Because you're there looking at the sky, looking around you, lost in some thicket. And you cannot but be aware that you are part of something enormous that is not the, the consequence of the machinations of man. I think that's what we've lost. In a way, I've always felt that the ideal way was to have that, that dual sensibility, to have a sense of the wilderness and a sense of the street. But more and more our consciousness as a society is being defined by the street. And the bunker grows from the street. So I think that really we need to think more deeply about who we are, where we are. And rather than seeing ourselves as time, as culture now more and more has us I think we are almost as if we exclude ourselves. You know, when I was a child, I was always astonished by everything. I was inside in this shape, this form, looking out as though from a tank, wondering, were these people also in tanks looking at me? <laughs> but I don't hear people saying these things to Vincent Brown much. I was, on, I was speaking, I will in a moment, I just want to finish with this, this little story. Uh, last year I was speaking, just after the Pope's speech in the, in the Bundestag, I was in uh, out the south side of Dublin in a, in a context somewhat different to this. It was a kind of a literary thing, and I, I chose as my subject the poetry of Patrick Kavanagh. And I chose the title Patrick Kavanagh and the Flash. And the meaning, very briefly, of that title was that Patrick Kavanagh believed that, that um, poetry was not literature, that it was theology. And the flash was what inhabited the poem. It was the thing that came through the words of the poem, a sign, a, a message, a sense from the other world. And that was the poet's gift to make this visible in words, which in a sense dissolved around the, the understanding, around, the, around the, the intense awareness that came through the poem. His brother Peter put it very beautifully when I asked him about this. Uh, Many years later, he said that, yes, he said, in a poem, the, least, the, poem, the words are the least important part. In a poem, the words burn up in a tremendous thread of something unusual. And I was talking about Cavan in these terms and about the fact that he was a Catholic poet, 
that he always described himself as a Catholic poet, by which he meant that he, not that he meant that he, he wasn't a daily communicant or anything, uh, but he, when he saw a clod of earth or a leaf or a tree or a bird or a human being, he saw the created thing. He had this intense awareness all the time of this other reality beyond the bunker. He couldn't see the bunker or saw through it. It was translucent for him. And so he wrote the poems out of this. But at the end, anyway, a man stood up uh, and said, and I could tell there was a kind of a frisson of, you know, tension and reluctance around the room as I spoke. And this man came up, stood up stuck, at the end, spoke up and uh, more or less appointed himself uh, spokesman for the disgruntled. And he said, <laughs> well, he said, I came here to hear about Patrick Kavanagh. I didn't come here for a lecture on Catholicism. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but uh, that's my understanding of Patrick Kavanagh, and I don't think you can talk about him without talking about his Catholicism. Oh, he says, come off it, you know. Um, he says, we don't need that old stuff anymore. He says, you know, fed up listening to all that stuff. He says, don't you realize, he says, that man has been to the moon. <laughs> and it was one of those strange situations. I, I, I mean, I didn't have an answer immediately, and, and uh, I, because it, what he was saying was so big. You know, it was as big a thing as you could possibly say in such a context. I mean, it's possibly something you might hear over in the skeptics room. <laughs> and. I kind of recognise it as also as a kind of a postcard from the bunker. It was, most, most, it was the bunker answering back, <laughs> saying, you know, man has been to the moon, come on, move on. And so I, I was a bit, uh, as, as Kavanagh would have said, that was a sore one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Kavanagh always had an answer to the sore ones too. Uh, and I said, I found something coming out of my mouth which I hadn't really thought through, or which wasn't really, it was what my father would have called a smart answer. I said, have you been to the moon? <laughs> and it turned out that he hadn't. <laughs> um, so I said to him, but you know, seriously, what difference has it made to your life as a man that another man has been to the moon? How have you been changed by this? Because I said, you know, Neil Armstrong went to the moon, as I, and as far as I know, he came back. And that first night back, he went to his bed and he lay and he slept. And in the morning, he woke and he got out and he looked in his bathroom mirror and he saw the face of Neil Armstrong and he said, who is this man? Who am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? And you know, a friend of mine, I spoke about to, this, uh, to him about this, and he sent me an article which he found which is about Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin in the moments before they left the spacecraft to walk on the surface of the moon. The last thing they did was celebrate communion together. And this is what we find, you know, in our culture, that the most astonishing thing is that, two things. First of all, that the adventurers we send out as part of our, project, our progress project to conquer nature, to conquer the universe, to bring back a confirmation of our omnipotence, and our omniscience. What happens to them is that they go out and are astonished all the more. They're bowled over by the awesome wonder. Their natural sense of wonder is restored to them because they're out of the bunker and they're out in the universe and they see this and they say, oh. But we, the rest of us, sitting in our warm bunkers with the central heating on and maybe a glass of red wine uh, while we watch on TV, we come to an entirely different conclusion, that the evidence of this, this adventuring is that we have taken over from God. That's what our culture concludes. Is this reasonable? I don't think so. So there's something deeply faulty, faulty about the way that we acquire evidence, that we conclude trumps or negates the witness that we have received about the world from our childhood, the extraordinary stories we have now put in this third bubble. 
And so I think that what we know from this is that reality is not what we are being told. Reality is different. There is a different way of seeing everything. But if you are told that there is only one way and you're told every day in the same way from seven in the morning until midnight, you're given this version of reality, eventually you think that you're the only one who still thinks that it's not the entire truth. And only when you occasionally, as Kavanagh says, meet somebody else and they happen to just let slip something that is unapproved, and you say, oh, another one. Could it be that this person is also a heretic, also a skeptic? Thank you.